Hello everybody, this is Di Antinatalist. And um, I have tried for numerous times to actually um, do this video, to create this video, and I have just put it off for months and months. Now, there was an original setback because um, like in December, um, Martin Dixon had um, has asked me to do an interview for him for the Cherwell Oxford newspaper in the UK. And I agreed to do um, the, the interview and we did the interview by text. I gave him about an hour and a half worth of texting and back and forth conversations. And um, I was really, really glad that, you know, this finally came into print, came into print uh, February of 2019, a couple of months after the interview. However, he failed to notify me that it was published and neither did he even tell me of the, um, the link, the online link to the article, nor did he secure a copy of the newspaper. So through many back and forth conversations um, um, with the Oxford newspaper, I did secure a newspaper finally, but it took about two months later. So uh, I have been busy with summer activities and responsibilities and pet care and trying to work out and, um, you know, physical therapy and all this kind of stuff that I had actually put off um, the taping of this article. Now, um, this is the actual newspaper and it's um, quite interesting because there's a couple of other um, similar articles that are linked to reproduction and sexuality, um, natalism. On the front cover here, there was an article that discusses the vulnerable population of students, which were the sex, sex workers. Now, sex workers can be male or female, but they're predominantly female. I won't go into detail um, about this, but uh, it says here, it's an incredibly dangerous type of work to be involved with. I have felt threatened and at risk with clients, which has caused significant mental and emotional obstacles in my life to overcome that have impacted on all sorts of relationships. And she admits that she cries during sex with her partner. Okay, now um, this is also a consequence that women encounter as a result of the porn industry. Porn industry is, is very damaging to women. But there's another article in here, which I thought was just really, really good at the same time that the antinatalist article came out Changing perceptions. Contraception contraception is not just a woman's issue. Well, it never was just a woman's issue. In fact, it is males that impregnate women and who leave them with potential harm. I don't know why the male population doesn't see that and takes remedy to challenge the damage and the harm that they can cause. Um, I'm just gonna read a part of her article. Okay. As drug trials for this drug progress, which is a drug for male contraception, reports of the side effects and how they were affecting men take over the news cycle. Men reportedly complained of mood swings, acne, and weight gain. For women who have used birth control, such as the pill, these side effects will be strangely familiar. They are, in fact, the same sorts of side effects many women experience when taking the pill or other methods of contraception, such as hormonal implants or the patch or injections, vaccinations, and the Nuva ring. Many newspapers told us that because of these side effects, men dropped out of the drug trial, resulting in its closure. However, this was erroneous reporting. 
Most men were happy to continue the trial. It was the trial monitors that decided to stop the trial because they were concerned about side effects men were experiencing and the medical ethics surrounding the issue. In this particular trial, 20% of men reported side effects, which led to the monitor's decision to shut it down. This would be less galling, but for the fact that in recent female contraceptive trials, 30% of women have reported side effects for the trial to be stopped. It is disappointing, but not surprising, that the side effects men had to suffer were viewed as intolerable despite the fact that women have routinely experienced similar side effects ever since the pill became widely available in the UK in the 1960s. Little has changed since then, and contraception is still considered an issue to be dealt with by women and women alone. Moreover, when conducting drug trials and other forms of medical testing, we can see that the concerns and harm to women simply aren't considered as important. When I have asked cisgendered men whether they would consider a contraceptive pill if it were available, most of them have expressed a reluctance to venture into the unknown. This particular fear is based on a wide range of factors. There is the fear of putting foreign substances into their bodies. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> um, I would think a fetus is a foreign body that some women just don't want to be there. The fear of how the body will change as a result of taking a contraceptive, such as acne and weight gain. Now, let me, let me stop there for a moment and say that there is no more bodily change than a pregnancy. There is no more harm and inconvenience and, you know, um, suffering and um, life change than a pregnancy. I mean, I have not had a child, but it is extremely taxing on a woman's body and her mental status. And there was also a fear that a contraceptive would affect their future ability to conceive negatively. But most important of all is the sense that contraception isn't their problem because even if they won't say it out loud, men know that they won't bear the consequences if they fail to use it. Contraception is not considered to be a conversation men need to be involved in. In a society where masculinity is often highly prized, the idea of talking about contraception methods with partners, let alone friends and peers, seems unthinkable and alien to many men. You know, um, it's really, really sad because, you know, women, I mean, men potentially inflict the harm on women by impregnating them. And they do not get the exchange of the same punishment and penalty of a pregnancy, an unwanted pregnancy. They deliver the harm, but they do not receive the harm. But the reason why men should be concerned is, number one, empathy, which I get it. They are not empathetic to a woman's potential crisis and challenges of you know, reproducing or seeking an abortion or, you know, um, having a miscarriage even or having an ectopic pregnancy and needing a, um, a life-saving operation. So empathy is number one, what is necessary to change the mindset of men. Number two, males are directly responsible if there is a pregnancy and if the pregnancy is carried out, those men are financially obligated for 18 years in almost every country and their paternity can be challenged by women. Um, they can be contested for paternity and they can even go to jail if they don't, um, 
pay for their children, um, at least in Western societies. But, uh, so, um, I'm going to post the link to my antinatalist article um, below my video so you can read it at length and I'm going to go over some highlights of this article. Now I will say before I go into detail that the article is a bit sour. It doesn't expose antinatalism in the most positive of lights. It is um, is a bit sarcastic at times, it is condescending at times. And um, so Martin Dixon interviewed me, but he must have gotten my name somewhere through the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, which is Let's Less Unites Movement and Organization. And he has a Facebook group, a very large Facebook group. and. Um, um, Let's Unite has a very sound argument. His organization and movement is very convincing and very well thought out and very comprehensive. I am a big fan of Les Knight's uh, group and his organization. And um, you can look up the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. Um, it, it, you know, it has very well... Um, a very well documented um, uh, facts on the environment, on population, on humanity, and it has a little bit of a different um, tone or tune, if you will, than antinatalism. But hey, hey guys, we're all you know we're all for the same thing, and that is voluntary human extinction. We we are for the elimination of humanity. Um, humanity is causing harm and is being caused harm. So antinatalism just attacks things from a little bit different angle. But Les Unite developed uh, his group and his um, movement back in the 70s. Um, and, you know, I will post a link to um, his um, website and um, I've spoken to Les before. It's been many years, but, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Les, and I don't argue with anything that he says. He's made some YouTube videos. He's very convincing. He's got a very mature and stable um, um, depiction of his views, and his views are right. His views are nothing but right. Um, I will say that this article does not mention any consulting of last night whatsoever. I was a little disappointed in that. It's possible that he couldn't get um, in touch with Les or he just used his website to create the article um, and leave him completely out of it. I do not know. I do not even know if Les has, um, is cognizant of this article, which I was, um, um, you know, interviewed for. And lastly, I will say, this is probably the most disappointing um, aspect about doing this article. Me and, uh, well, Martin and I conversed at length over many days, and I say it's probably an hour and a half of content that I gave him. And at the end of my article, I could tell that he had a slant a slant that was a little bit sour and negative. And I asked him, after doing this interview with you and hearing my perspective and, um, you know, just a comprehensive viewpoint of mine and antinatalism, do you think you're going to have children? And he said, yes, I, I really do. I think, you know, I'm, I definitely want to have children. And that was the biggest disillusionment because I actually thought with my convincing statements and my, you know, mature approach, I thought that I would be able to convince somebody who might have been on the fence, so to speak. 
but um you know in retrospect he could have been even mocking the organization or myself and less um but there's no more legitimate person than, than Les Knight. Um, I really, really like Les. In fact, he was one of the first people who um, lured me into voluntary human extinction, um, you know, or organizations and um, the, the theory, the complete theory, which led me to anti-natalism and, and I suppose ethelism and, and the likes. But let me go through this article. A person would have to be delusional to appreciate existence. Life is a net negative and existence perpetuates suffering. It's just some of the festive wisdom. Diane Brandy. <laughs> That's another thing. Um, he misspelled my name and I corrected my name at the end of our, in, end of our interview and he didn't bother to correct it. Oh, no, she's not an Oxford student in the grips of a pre-collections crisis. She's a subscriber to the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. The movement was given its name in 1991 by Les Unite. Okay, it's not, he says it's 1991. I, I believe it. I thought it was in the 70s, but I have to correct myself on that. Les Unite, its most high-profile activist to date, even his name, if you say it quickly enough, is a piece of subliminal propaganda. Well, I would have to disagree there. I think it's very catchy and I think it's um, very creative. One of the most common rumors which swirls around vehement is that it's a salt cult, suicide cult. It's not. It's not even an organization, let alone a cult. Voluntary human extinction is a philosophy, a set of beliefs, lifestyle more than anything else, revolving around stewardship of the planet. The movement's tenets are hard to define. They really don't have any. The vehement isn't an organization. It's a disorganization. It's its lively Facebook community with nearly 9,000 members hasn't accepted anyone new in two years. Its website hasn't been updated since its creation. The formatting is quite medieval. The exit time, well, anyway, not, none of that really matters. Um, human extinct, voluntary human extinction is not popular and neither is anti-natalism. People are steadfast in their um, right, if you will, to reproduce. They have urges to reproduce. They are not thinking when they reproduce. It is their genitals or genitalia which is doing the thinking. Um, it, you know, it doesn't take a brain to have sex. It takes a brain to use birth control. <laughs> um... Fundamentally, antinatalism is the belief that having children is harmful, and thus, implicitly, that the earth is overpopulated. Hence, the idea of human extinction. The vehement slogan is, may we live long and die out. But harmful to what? While environmentalists agree humans are harmful to the earth's ecology, some hardcore antinatalists go a step further. Over the Christmas vacation, I spoke to Diane. Um, yeah, Chalfrey Brandy. It's not Chalfrey Brandy at all, but he um, <laughs> it was Chalfrey Diane or um, Bandy is my the correct spelling of my name. Um, she represents many of the views on the anti-natalist extinctionist spectrum. Diane left me under no illusion that humans are the cause of environmental degradation with statements like, the only way to spare suffering to our species and that which is done to other species by mankind is to stop reproducing. And mankind has been harmed and harmful since the beginning. She's not wrong. <laughs> okay, now that has a lot of power in it. 
he uses a double negative and he says she's not wrong um martin will not give me the credit for being right and people who withhold praise usually do so because they feel that giving someone else praise takes away from them. Diane's argument, which she suggests is a maxim of any antinatalist or human extinctionist is logical and scientifically proven. Earth and the environment would be better off without its bipedal tyrants. That's where the logic ended. Um, from here onwards, Diane's vehement philosophy strayed from science to the realms of depressing misanthropy. I found it striking that while she raised the issue of humanity's impact on the environment, her focus always turned back to humanity's impact on itself. For a self-identified environmentalist and animal activist, the human predicament seems to take surprising primacy over the environmental. Diane certainly cares about nature and animals. Having rescued dogs and cats for over two decades, she describes them as vulnerable and voiceless, while calling her stance toward human welfare indifferent. She went on to say it's impossible to be vegan as we all inadvertently kill insects and animals because of massive amounts of animal slaughter globally and domestic pet euthanasia rates in my country alone. This is a major reason that I want humans to become extinct. The mention of animals and the environment seem just interlaced into and secondary to her belief in self-perpetuated human suffering. Diane believes that voluntary human extinction, a mass absence from procreation until humankind dies out naturally, would do humans a favor as much as it would alleviate environmental problems. Well, let me pause there. What is the argument here? Because if we no longer reproduce, nobody would enter existence and become harmed. I mean, that's just so fundamental. I don't, I just don't know how to explain it any more clearly. I think um, a short sentence is, you know, quite understandable. When you reproduce, you perpetuate human harm. There, there, and that's no question. That That's not even arguable. <laughs> um, I mean, I can say it till I'm blue in the face. And... People like Martin Dixon um, are, are not grasping this concept at all. And there's been many, many great antinatalists. Um, um, uh, everybody knows Dana. Everybody knows Amanda. Everybody knows Matt of Life Sucks. Um, and, and those are just a few of the Americans. Um, there's a host of antinatalists. Oh, uh, Oh my goodness, there's, well, right off the top of my head, I can probably think about 12 names. Um, a very convincing anti-natalist. And, uh, and Mendham has had videos out for years and thousands of subscribers to his YouTube channel. And he has very convincing argument, arguments. He's brilliant. So anyway, yes, um, it would do humans a favor as much as it would alleviate environmental problems. Part of this is what Diane calls the tragedy of the birth. A central antinatalist belief that birth and procreation is selfish and negative and that children are hauled unfairly into a world of suffering, almost as a pet for their parents to love and receive unconditional love back. The child's birth, suffering, and eventual death was not consensual, and parents should be fully accountable for their children's or their offspring's welfare and financial needs till death. 
indicate how in the eyes of the vehement procreation is criminal. When I asked Diane how she justifies this view, she gave me her rendition of life as a hopeless struggle. Growing numbers are seeing the rawness of reality. Get up, shower, go to work after being in traffic. Spend your youth in the workforce. Take heed that animals suffered and were slaughtered for your meal. Drive home, pay bills, resolve tension at home with the children. Go to the doctor, worry and die. Perhaps her views stem from somewhere else entirely. When I asked about her religious orientation, she replied, for the most part, I was raised with religion. I eventually rejected it because it wasn't logical. Antinatalism is logical. here. Diane rejected her faith out of a pessimism for humanity, refuting religion as illogical compared to the rationality of antinatalism. Yet her own logical beliefs and some of the core ideas of religion intertwine. Now, I will pause there and say that that is his perspective. Um, he emphasizes a little bit more on the religious aspect than he should have. And I merely posted a few quotes on our interview forum, which were biblical quotes. And I have posted those quotes to um, reach the, um, to reach the ears of religious folk, churchgoers, believers, I merely quoted um, some verses in the Bible that were anti-natalist because many natalists and reproducers quote the only quote that I know of in the Bible that refers to reproduction, which is in Genesis, and it says, go forth and multiply. However, a biblical scholar told me that that information was given to only Adam and Eve and not believers in general. Okay, so. Rather, like many, her beliefs align with religion selectively. And that is true. Natalists are very selective. They cherry pick verses in the Bible that pertain to breeding, fertility, and reproduction. Many of her beliefs seem more emotional than logical. Ironically, her claim that a person would have to be delusional to appreciate existence seems itself delusional. But Diane's views do not represent that of all vehement supporters, and certainly not those of the movement's figurehead, Less Unite. Les doesn't even insist, like Diane, that many parents are in denial over their resentment over having children, instead saying of people who have already had children that there is no reason to feel guilty about the past. Les, Les is correct. Les is a very patient and tactful person. And Les, I hope you were watching this. I have a great amount of respect for you. A very, very great amount of respect. On balance, Les is almost the polar opposite of Diane. He values rather than denounces humans. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, that's not true at all. Um, the fact that I value suffering and that I fact that I am ab aberrant and intolerant of suffering means that I don't want any baby or toddler or teenager or adult to suffer. If that doesn't de denote um, appreciating humanity in life, I don't know what does. Because continuing and preserving our species, self-preservation 
is basically harm and it starts off as self-harm. You are harming yourself through your children when you have children. Okay, so back to the article. He values rather than denotes humans, takes a tolerant view towards antinatalist and emits a hopefulness rather than a despair towards the human race. Uh, I don't know how you cannot have a despair towards the human race. I mean, um, what was it last week, a couple weekends ago in America, we had two mass shootings. <laughs> um, you know, we have starva uh, starvation and poverty um, are in the paper every day. Um, sexual harassment, um, rape, and um, pedophilia. Yeah. Who was it? Um, what was his name? Ein Einstein or what is his name? <laughs> the, the guy that just killed himself in um, Ein Einstein just killed himself by hanging in the prison um, because he was really facing a lot of years or life in prison because of um, sex trafficking. Yeah, that's 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 a really good reason to lose um, hope and and have despair towards the human race. And things aren't getting better. And um, things were never good. I mean, people who follow the Bible have, you know, biblical proof from scrolls that people harmed one another. Cain and Abel harmed one another. Families harmed one another. Nature harms people. Um, people suffer. People age. People die. People get diseased. In any case, the stark differences between Les and Diane's vehement views show just how vague and personalized it is as a concept. The 9,000 people in the movement's Facebook group and perhaps many thousands of supporters worldwide are like moths, each with their own perspective and life experience, attracted to the shining light of antinatalism. Well, the, the fact that people have different concepts from, from any philosophy is going to be true. Each and every person carries different baggage to the table, carries different mindsets, and every natalist and every pro-lifer, every um, religious person has different concepts about Christ or about religion or about Buddhism or, um, you know, Mormonism or um, the following of Mohammed, you know, um, yeah, I mean, you could even say that every chocolate lover likes something different in chocolate. I mean, yes, certainly. I'm a chocolate lover, and I like really, really dark chocolate, and I love nuts in my chocolate, but there are chocolate lovers who don't like nuts, and there are chocolate lovers who love milk chocolate. So, not all chocolate lovers feel the same way about chocolate, do they? Boy, what a load of crap. There is an assumption that people can just stop having children. This has more than a tinge of white middle class privilege about it. Correct. Martin, you are very, very correct about that. And perhaps sometimes our views in antinatalist groups are a little bit swayed and um, geared towards our privilege living in Western worlds. The developing world doesn't always have the privilege of readily available cheap contraception. In parts of the developing world, the deficit in female emancipation means some women cannot assert control of their own biology. State welfare for the elderly is non-existent children are almost a necessity. Well, he is very correct about that. And many women around parts of the world don't even choose when or if to have sex and who they will be married to. What matters is that parts of the developing world can't afford not to have children, while in the developing world, it is a matter of who can afford them. That's true, in part. 
Ultimately, antinatalism is a luxury billions cannot afford. And the idea that everyone should just stop reproducing as simply as that feels almost pompous. And I'm, I'm really glad for his um, constructive criticism there because I think myself as well as other antinatalists can actually develop criteria which um, addresses this problem. And we certainly don't want to seem as pompous, but I, I, I actually think, and I do think, that we Westerners are speaking to other Westerners. I don't think we're actually preaching down to developing country women or men. We actually see our own country, um, the USA, which is the third largest country in the world. And we see our own population and we are afflicted and affected by our own population very negatively. So we, we speak to our own, we really do. Um, but we do need to branch out and probably need to be a lot more empathetic and sympathetic to populations um, because literally we can't even control our own population's growth and we're not very convincing to even other Westerners, Americans, Canadians, Australians, Europeans, the British. So how could we possibly influence develop developing country people if we can't even change the ideas and the mindsets of our own people? which we are not doing a very good job of. And it's, it's not a fault of our own. It's a fault of religion and it's a fault of um, family structures and culture and tradition and biological urges. Those come, all of those um, aspects come before the aspect of logic and the fact that bringing people into the world is going to harm them. Mm -hmm. Nobody l wants to listen that self-preservation in the form of reproduction is harm. Nobody wants to hear it. We are not saying what people want to hear. For me, the vehemence and its twin philosophy, antinatalism, certainly contain a d d degree of reason. Ha, huh, okay. A degree of reason. Um, it's a bit sarcastic there, but I'm glad he did state that. Especially when considering the toxicity of human activity to the natural world and its major role in what feels like the insurmountable threat of climate change. The great human mission seems insurmountable until it's surmounted. Voluntary human extinction feels overwhelmingly defeatist. It appears a sensible misanthropic nihilist and seems to attract mostly the latter. Last night's cheery environmentalist and philanthropic rationalism doesn't change the fact that he's given up. Anybody who subscribes to the vehement is proverbial, proverbial, poof, I can't even speak my own language, proverbially abandoning ship. Okay, so what? I think the fact that we're smart enough to abandon ship when it's on a wrong course says a lot for our um, our power as a species because, you know, apparently we have the, the strongest, the highest brain power. We are able to create language. We are able to um, do major harm, in fact. But as a result of our capacity to think, we also need to think and realize that our species is harming itself, harming nature, and is not going anywhere. We've got 7.5 or 6 billion people on the planet now. With so many bodies on the planet, 
We don't have a cure for cancer. We don't have a cure for poverty, political tension, and crime. Um, male violence is on the increase. We don't have a cure for sexual harassment, sexual addiction, um, substance abuse. We, we are just going down the pot. And it's enlightened people who can take this knowledge and actually try to convince other people that we need to abandon ship. And that's the positive and reactionary um, effect of our brain power. The fact that the fact that we realize that, you know, for thousands of years and for generations and generations that we are not any better off than where we started from. Yes, we are more progressive. Yes, uh, you know, we have the potential to use the internet. We have the potential to go to colleges and learn many things and to travel and to um, invent cures for certain things. And, um, you know, we have scientists and we have doctors and we have, um, <laughs> yeah, we have a whole host of people who are, you know, who correct human ills and diseases, but we are no better off than we were in the very beginning because we just have a new set of problems to tackle. So, um, it's the continuation of the species that's harmful. Abandoning ship is not harmful. So, this is my rebuttal to Martin Dixon's um, um, long article. I will wrap it up by saying here, through the, though the movement is by no means organized or popular, it is international and highlights an intensifying pessimism towards our environmental predicament. Pessimism isn't productive and hardly the remedy needed to combat climate change and pressure on national resources. Well, adding up to 8 billion people on the planet is not pr productive either. It's counterproductive. It's impeding our progress and productivity. And uh, it's defeatist. Um, the fact that he considers in antinatalism, defeatist, and abandoning ship, um, actually reproducing into a frenzy is defeatist. And humanity is going down whether it voluntary, voluntarily extinguishes itself or not. Nature will curb human population. Instead of turning to movements grounded in unproductive, self-pitying, and often very questionable philosophy, this generation needs to devise a solution or at least a mitigation to threats such as climate change, be it scientific, social, or political. It's either that or pick up a Slipknot album from HMV and book that vasectomy. Your choice. Uh-huh. Huh. Well, and this is a photograph of Les Unite. Or Les Knight is his um, given name, I believe. Um, Martin Dixon, you know, had a sarcastic and rather snide um, impression, um, uh, you know, of, of my interview after my interview and of antinatalism and voluntary human extinction. But um, unless we do abandon ship, um, we are definitely defeating our own species. And I think it's best to surrender and hold up that white flag while we have our dignity, while we have a chance to do it on our own. Who wants to be defeated by nature? or by a war, perhaps, or some other kind of cosmic or, um, you know, man or even a man-made um, um, detriment that, that wipes us all out. Isn't it best to, to hold up the flag and say, hey, 
we know that we should stop reproducing. We know that we've caused harm. We know that bringing children into the world exposes them to countless vulnerabilities and um, indescribable events and unpredictabilities. Isn't it best to say, you know what? We're, we're just going to surrender. We're going to peacefully, um, we're going to live long and die out. Just like Les Knight's slogan, let us live long and die out. That is the more productive and peaceful way to go. That is the way we can die out as a species with the most dignity. So thank you for watching this long video and I will post links down below. Please subscribe and comment. Um, and um, no matter how unpopular our philosophies are, we must be outspoken. The fact that it is unpopular means that we have to speak louder and worldwide.